Well, congratulations, mate. It's been a fantastic 2022. What is being recognised as the New Zealand Rugby's Coach of the Year, what does that mean to you after this campaign? Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> Until now. Until now. <laughs> you always feel a bit awkward. Like, you feel awkward about individual awards, don't you, in a team game. You're so reliant on so many people. So you, all you can do is really accept it on behalf of everyone else. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Look, when you committed to this role, though, and as you know, the, the role of the head coach is, has so much weight and, and so much responsibility. What was it you were ultimately trying to achieve? I had a meeting on the 14th of January, still remember the date, it's etched in there, with, um, I had lunch, oh, breakfast actually, with Mark Robinson in um, Waihi. And at that point, um, you know, we'd been discussing the Black Ferns and the fact that they hadn't gone well in Europe and, you know, there was a report coming out and all that sort of stuff. And, and because Glenn Moore and John Haggard and Wes Clark were mates, um, I offered my services to give them a bit of a hand on the grass now and again. Now, how that turned into me becoming director of rugby is quite a long story, but round about end of March, I got contacted to say, yeah, they'd be keen for me to come and help them. So essentially that's what I did. I went into the environment to try and help them with whatever they wanted me to do um, as a mentor, really, um, and some stuff on the grass. And then, um, like it's history now, but that, that report came out. Um, a few of the staff felt they couldn't stay in the environment. You know, the head coach left, Glenn left, John Haggett left. So... I'm left in the middle. <laughs> so that's where it started. And from the very first day when I spoke to the girls, I said something that I probably didn't believe myself, but I said that we're going to win the World Cup, but we're not going to win it today. But we're going to win it at Eden Park in front of 40,000 people. And so that was our dream. And so we, we built that together. I wanted to teach the, the women how to play a really attacking game. So rather than follow the herd, Graham Henry and I had done a lot of work on looking at the end of year tour. Mike Cron joined us, he, he did the same. So we came to the conclusion together we couldn't beat France and England playing a traditional game. And all of a sudden it became apparent that the girls were really excited by it. And particularly Ruhe Dumont, who, who we made captain, she understood it straight away. She could see the potential and she, she could see how it would motivate all these girls. And so that's, that was our plan. No, nothing more than that. Nothing more <laughs> than that. So how was this then, as a coaching experience, different to any other coaching experience you've had before? I saw it as an adventure. Um, like every coaching experience you have is different, but it's always an adventure. It's never the same. You know, I'd been to a few World Cups with, with the All Blacks, obviously. Um, they were high pressure environments. I was really keen in this one to change that and, and make it fun. Some of it was bedded in some work that we did with the Crusader, uh, with um, All Blacks years ago around hormonal balance needed to be at your best for a game and we did a lot of spitting into vials and there was scientists doing the research but essentially what it found out was early in the week you need to have a lot of laughter, get rid of the cortisol and and enhance your recovery and in, at the end of the week that's where you built the testosterone to be great on the weekend. So we looked at a program where up until Tuesday night we had a lot of fun, a lot of excitement, a lot of innovation. We had a club nights on a Tuesday night. Um, we had a club captain. We didn't have a lot of resource so we went and bought a, a blazer for her down at the op shop. Got some pins on it, you know, and she ran it like a club night. and. Um, and it sort of spilled over into our game, where there was a lot of, everyone saw it as a bit of an adventure and exciting to play this game. We went perfect at it, particularly early on. Um, but you could see the attacking intent and their courage to have a crack, even from our own goal line. If it was on, it was on. And we, and we just played and we backed our skills. And so from that point of view, um, yeah, I, I would say it's probably one of the best projects of my life, most exciting anyway. So how then, in less than 12 months, does this group become World Cup winners? And we became a professional team. 
you know, and it, it happened through the campaign. We became a high quality, um, high performance team. And we started, we looked like one, we started to look like one. So um, yeah, it was, a, it was probably an evolution rather than a revolution. The revolution was the type of game we we're gonna play. The evolution was people buying into it and then producing a great output in, in their areas. Um, so that was, that was really good to see. Do you feel any pressure, Smithy, of the fact that, because you, you are, look, I, I can talk from experience here, you're a rugby genius. Given all of your experiences, was, was coaching the Black Ferns, did you have to rethink some of the, the things that you already knew? Um, no. I, other than build-ups to games, uh, essentially I just treated them the same as I'd treated any men's team at, at training. We trained at the same level. Do I feel the pressure? Not really. The thing that I wasn't sure about was, can we actually play this game? And do they want to play this game? But it became apparent that A, they wanted to play it, and B, they had the courage to play it. And it almost became an undoing at the end, as you could see, um, because they started seeing that those attacking opportunities in every situation, and sometimes it wasn't appropriate, but they're still gonna have a crack. And uh, I loved that. I loved that in them, and was prepared to, I don't know about them, but I was prepared to lose and still stay on the track of that, that sort of game because I think the, the country loved it. We weren't following anyone else. We had a set of only us skills um, because we were the only ones playing like we were playing. We felt unique and I think the girls, the players felt special playing that game. You've had a few weeks now though to, to I suppose, take a breath to, to consider what you've been through. Are you proud of this? job you've done maybe a little bit different than other jobs you've done? I think I've been proud of virtually every team I've coached. There's a difference here in that the girls need to feel good to play well and so your whole build-up is different. The men, if they play well they feel good and the build-up's different. You'd be used to this too. Goldie, get on a bus, it's silence. The odd player will have head headphones on listening to something but generally it's silence. As a, you know, it's, it's tense, everyone's got a few nerves. But that's the way you build up as a, in a men's team. In a women's team, you hop on the bus to the game and the music's pumping. And Crono and I, two of the old blokes, we're, stand, we're sitting there trying to have a bit of a <laughs> focus on what we're going to be doing in the, in the warm-up and in the changing room. And I got to the stage where I thought it was beautiful. Whereas initially I wanted to change it, but I felt it was probably not the right thing to do. <laughs> um, and it's beautiful because it's been a hard road for them to get there they treasure it, and they're going to make the most of it. The New Zealand game has tasted success for years. We've won multiple rugby mm. world cups. You know, this is not the first time we've been here, but clearly we've had to overcome some adversity. What is it you hope that uh, this is the start of? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It, the way I see it happening is a professionalisation happening. There's no doubt about that. It's not just about money, but it's about resource. It's about giving women the opportunity to work part-time but train fully. The Farrah Palmer Cup coaches are, are good, you know, and, and becoming outstanding. So there's a, there's a real growth in the game. And I just think we need to be careful the way, the speed at which we professionalise it and, and how that's done, because there are a lot of differences, you know, between the, the two genders. But, you know, you, we've got lawyers, teachers, corporate workers, students in the team, and that's great. And so whether there can be some way of, of raising the contracts whilst keeping them involved in, in their other life, you know, because they're going to have, most of them will have children. Um, at that point, do they keep playing or do they stop and then they've got to have a career? And I know New Zealand Rugby's putting a lot of effort into this in terms of getting this right. Was there a point during this campaign where... You actually did think to yourself, you know what, I think we can win this. <laughs> you know, like, at what point in the season? Yeah, like, t to be honest, I think we had a 1 in 10 chance of beating England. You know, they had 30 test wins on a trot, which is unheard of. Great coach in Simon Middleton, um, a great roster. We had done a lot of work on trying to stop those malls, but it's just been impossible. If we knew everything had to go well. Wes, Wes was really up about the game and... He thought we were going to win. I think the rest of us felt we need everything to go really well for us to, to win this. And yeah, you go and prepared to win or lose, don't you? 
I was pretty tough on the girls publicly because I wanted this. I wanted everyone to understand that we were trying to raise the standards and um, what that looked like. Privately, we had a hell of a great um, integration, I think, staff and, and players. And there's a lot of excitement. Every training room was a lot of excitement. The, the players, like every other player, they just want honesty, you know, and they just want it in the belly. There's no issue there with that, and they just want to get better. And so we just got better and better through the tournament. And we were a way better team by the end than we'd been at the start, and you'd expect that. Um, but it was just great to be part of it. Have you coached a day since? Three weeks. No. You haven't coached a day? No. Have you even thought about no. the game? No. <laughs> Come on now, you've no. just talked about it in detail here. No, I've been down to the bar, <laughs> Bryce's bar down in town here, and we talk about why he, <laughs> athletic, uh, see how they're going in pre-season, but that's about the <laughs> extent of it. So what's next? Because I think that's probably what everyone's thinking, because the search is on for the next coach for the Blackburns. Yep. Are you going to play a role in that? Would you like to play a role in that? Um, we're all saying to New Zealand Rugby, how, how do they keep Wayne Smith involved? What's next for you? Well, essentially, what's next for me is retirement, certainly semi-retirement. I go back to Japan in January um, to Kobe for three weeks. I'm really just working with the coaches there. Graham and I are heading to Tonga early February. Um, so he and I, and a really good friend of ours, Saliva, and another friend, Rusty, we've got a little timber business over there. So we're trying to provide really cheap building materials to the Tongan people. Um, but we've got a whole lot of rugby gear that we want to take around the, around the schools. Chiefs have given us heaps of jerseys and Auckland Rugby gave us a heap of balls. And so we're going to take that around the schools and try and raise the morale a wee bit, you know, after the tsunami. So that's in February. Um, go back to Japan, I think, for another few weeks after that. And then I'm going to Italy to catch up with, with people, all my mates. Do you think you're done in terms of being... I don't think so. I, I think I'm... Um, I talk about retirement, you know. You've uh, s- you're thrown it out there, yeah, but yeah. it doesn't sound as though I you're talk, doing I talk something. about it because it's... Um, I'm semi-retired. Um, and you never know what's going to come up. But I can't see myself being a full-time coach anymore. We do a, a job like Ted was doing for me. Um, that sort of job. But to run the whole programme... No, I'm not ready to do that again, not this year. Um, whether it happens again in the future, I'm not sure. We'll see how I go.